Well, good morning, Northland. Yeah, it's good to be with you. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn them on, or you can open them to Acts chapter 15. And even while you're doing that, let's extend a warm welcome to our extended Northland family at Ponce Inlet. You have Seminole County Jails, Bridges of America. We got also micro churches meeting in West Palm, Georgia, New York. Like this is pretty incredible what God's doing here. Will you give it up for them? Also, if uh, you've seen like a video camera, like in the lobby outside in here, we are shooting video to put online so that people can get just a little taste of Northland before they come here. But you know that you can't really get a taste until you come here, right? You know that, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can't get you know, the splash zone right here, you know, so, uh, Anyways, we are in the book of Acts. We're going through the book of Acts in our series, Empowered. And so as I was thinking about where we're going this morning, uh, this image I put together for you because I have a question. What do all of these people have in common? So you got Mark Zuckerberg and Eduardo Severin. Uh, You got Simon and Garfunkel. Anybody, were you here when Shaq and Penny played together? Who was here? Okay, all right, we got a few people. All right, the Beatles, and then just for kicks and giggles, I put some fictional characters, uh, Captain America and Iron Man. What do all of these people have in common? They, They were partners, but did somebody say they broke up? Okay, so yeah, they broke up. Yes, right, they broke up. They split up. Now, what does that have to do with where we're at? Well, what we will see today is that Paul and Barney, or Barnabas, they were the dynamic duo that broke up. And so these people, they have, you know, some similarities with Paul and Barnabas. They were partners, they were a band, but then they went their separate ways. You know, Shaq actually believes that he could have won, he could have won a championship here in Orlando if he would have stayed long enough, but they they didn't get along uh, too well. So it was pretty interesting reading their story. And so what we will see here in Acts 15 is that you have Paul and Barnabas. They were the band of brothers, and now they will become the bands of brothers. Now, I actually got two main points, and one is for Paul and Barnabas, and one is for John Mark. And here's Paul and Barnabas' main point. Sometimes God prompts leaders to split over sharp disagreements about strategy that will multiply mission efforts. So that's Paul and Barnabas. There will be times you have leaders that will split over these disagreements around strategy that leads to a multiplied mission effort. And then here's John Mark's main point, is that sometimes God allows for disappointments that develop us for later duties. So you're going to see with John Mark, there was a disappointment in his life, but that disappointment was not going to define him. He was going to let it to develop him for later duties that, ha- that God had for him. And see, what we will learn today will help us understand why actually some leaders cannot work together. M- maybe, maybe you got a decision right now. Do I stay with my business partner or do I not stay with my business partner? Uh, so maybe some of you, you are uh, under someone. You're like, do I even stay at this business or not? And so what we're going to learn is when do you stay? When do you leave? Uh, we're going to, if you're a leader, you're going to actually learn, okay, h- how do I understand myself that really will help me understand who I need to put on my team to support what we are uh, doing. And then some of you, if you've had a disappointment, maybe you're living in a disappointment, hopefully you will learn how to bounce back from that today. Uh, I'm really, really excited about today because not only do I get to share some of my story, but I get to talk about leadership as it intersects the mission of God. And if you know anything about me, I love the mission of God and I also love uh, leadership. And we see both of them intersect here in Acts 15. So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? So Dr. Luke, he is writing the book of Acts, this record of what's happening in the early church. And here's what he pins. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, hey, bro, let's go back and visit the believers in all of the towns where we had preached the word of the Lord, and let's just see how they are doing. Now, Barnabas wanted to take John, Ma- John also called Mark, that's why we call him John Mark, uh, with him, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him. Why? Because John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. 
They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted ways. They parted company. Now, Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Now, Paul and Silas, they went through Syria, Cilicia, and they strengthened the churches. Let's pray. Father, may you be glorified. Jesus, I pray that you would be the center of our lives, that you would be the center of Northland. Spirit, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment as we unpack your word. I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to comprehend, a heart to receive what you have for us as you shape and mold us more into the image of our king as we lead in life and as we live life. May you be glorified for it's in your name we pray our king. Amen. You may be seated. So the fascinating part about this story is it comes right after the Jerusalem Council. Now, if you have been here the last several weeks, we've looked at that really debate in the early church. What is the gospel? So what is the good news? What saves people? And so we saw that Jesus Christ is the gospel that is only Jesus and faith in him that saves one from the penalty of their sins. And they talked about what the Gentile Christians needed to do in some sense to maintain unity between Jew, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. So, so Acts 15 is all, has been all about unity. Well, we come to this particular story and you're like, oh my gosh, uh, should, should we be alarmed now that Paul and Barnabas are breaking up? I mean, like they were part of this unifying effort between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians and now they're going their separate ways. Well, what we'll see today is no need for an alarm uh, be, because it's not a church split. It's more of this missional, this, this missional split over strategy that will multiply mission efforts. So no, no need, no need to be an alarmist here for Paul and Barnabas and them going their separate ways as we will see this morning. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you one big leadership principle and one big life lesson principle principle that we're going to live by. The leadership will be applied to Paul and Barnabas. The life lesson will be applied to John Mark. So here's the leadership lesson. Uh, leaders can both be right and their rightness can cause a rift in the partnership and thus a multiplication of ministry and mission. So there's going to be times where leaders, you are both right, but your rightness can cause a rift in the partnership. And that's what we see with Paul and Barnabas. Now their rift was over a person. It was over John Mark. So let me give you a little bit of background about John Mark. So we've, we first are introduced to John Mark in Acts 12. Now uh, there is another part of scripture where we are introduced to him prior, but I don't want to give that one away yet. But just in the book of Acts, uh, we see him in Acts chapter 12, where his family hosted a house church there in Jerusalem. So he's probably from a wealthy family because again, there needed to be larger houses to accommodate many people to gather. And so probably his family is a very wealthy family. Now we also see that John Marks, he gets to actually experience some pretty cool things. Like the first experience that he had was when Peter got miraculously freed from prison. Like God just miraculously freed him and he shows up at John Mark's house. And could you imagine your young John Mark and you've heard that Peter's in prison. You, you hear that persecution is, is kind of happening towards those who believe in Jesus. But yet, in the, you know, that night you see Peter in flesh. And like, you're like, oh my gosh, this is pretty incredible. We serve a incredible God. Well, you fast forward and then you have Paul and Barnabas. They come on the scene and they want to take a first missionary journey. Well, they're looking at team members. Well, who do they need to take with them? And you have Barnabas, who is actually the cousin of John Mark. And he tells Paul, hey, I think we ought to take my cousin, John Mark. I think he'd be a good addition. And Paul's like, oh, sounds good. Let's, let's take him. And so John Mark gets to go with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. And he actually sees some pretty cool things. Like one of the things that he saw was how Paul called upon the Holy Spirit to bring blindness to this magician named Elimus. I mean, pretty cool. John Mark gets to experience that. Like, wow, the Spirit of God is 
powerful. Look, look at the spirit of God work through Paul. Like he's experiencing that. And then they go to Perga in Pamphylia. So that was the next stop. And it was there, we don't know why, but John Mark leaves Paul and Barnabas. Now, maybe he missed his mommy, don't know. Maybe he missed his bed, possibly. Maybe he missed his Fruit Loops, his video games, his TV shows. Maybe he missed the season tickets that he had to the magic there in Jerusalem. We just don't know. All we know is that he leaves. He deserts Paul and Barnabas. So some years passed, and now we pick up, and Paul says to Barney, hey, bro, I think we, I think we ought to go back to the churches that we went to the very first time we went a few years back and just strengthen them, see how they're doing. And Barnabas is like, man, this is a, this is a really good idea, Paul. Who should we take? And so as Paul is thinking about who they need to take, Barnabas is like, I think we need to take John Mark. And uh, Paul's like, over my dead body. Like he immediately, oh no, we, we are not taking John Mark. Do you know what that kid did to us years ago there, Barney? Like he left us high and dry. He was crying to his mommy. He, he missed, you know, like we are not taking him. And then Barnabas is like, Paul, listen here there. They're, they're sucker. Like, uh, you remember like what I did to you? Like you wouldn't be in the position that you are in if I would not have encouraged you. Listen, I got my nickname, son of encouragement, because I encouraged you. We should take John Mark. And Paul and Barnabas, they have this rift over John Mark. And, and the question that many people ask when they come to this passage is, who is right? So they're gonna ask, who's right? Now I've already tipped my hat. But let me ask you, if you were just reading this passage for the very first time, who do you think is right? So how many of you, you think Paul is right? Not to take John Mark, you can raise your hand, okay? How many of you think Barnabas would be right to take John Mark? Give him a second chance, okay? So we, we got some good, caring, you know, people out there. But, but here's, what, here's what I do believe is that they are, they're both right. They, they are both right. Right, now you're probably thinking this question, how are they both right? I'm so glad that you asked that question. Here, here's the reason why. This is not a matter of church unity because if it was a matter of church unity, they both would be wrong by maintaining the unity. And especially over this kind of disagreement, it's silly. You're gonna let John Mark split a church. It is not about church unity. This is not about splitting a church. This is about a missional strategy to fulfill a missional purpose, and that's where the disagreement lies. So I need to be very clear because when you're reading chapter 15, yes, the first part of chapter 15 is all about maintaining church unity, fighting for church unity. This is about fulfilling a missional purpose and implementing a missional strategy, and that's where a disagreement, that's where a split occurred, and there's two perspectives here. Now, Paul, he, here's his perspective. He wanted someone dependable. Barnabas saw someone to develop. So they're looking at it in two completely different ways. Now, I want to kind of drill down on this, this split of perspectives because to really understand this split of perspectives, you've got to understand three elements. And here are the elements you need to understand. You need to understand personalities of leaders, purposes of the mission or the project and the people you need on the team. So really to understand this split, you gotta understand these three elements. Personality, you need to understand the project and you need to understand the people that are needed to fulfill the project. All right, so here's a question. Do you know how you are wired? Do you know how you are wired? Because however you are wired is going to impact how you lead. And I do believe that Probably everyone in here, you lead in some capacity. Maybe you lead your family. Maybe you lead a department, a division. Maybe some of you lead businesses. Maybe some of you lead by influence in a team because people look to you. I don't know, but here's what I would say is that most people, if not all people, they lead in some capacity. And how you and I are wired will impact how we lead. Now, here's another. How many of you, you have heard of personality profile tests? How many of you have heard of, okay. How many of you have taken a personality profile Profile test. Okay, how many of you need to? If you haven't, you, you need to raise your hand. Anyway, so I love personality 
test because they give you a glimpse into how you are wired. Now, let me be very clear. Personality tests are not exact, but they are enlightening. They are not inerrant, but they are informative. And they're not meant to be your identity, but to identify potential strengths and blind spots in your life. I love personality tests. Like years ago, when I first took the DISC test, this is years ago, I was reading all the strengths of these and I'm like, oh yeah, oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. But then I was, I was reading potential blind spots and here was one of my blind spots is that uh, because these are, are intense and aggressive, their passion can be mistaken for anger. And so I'm like, that's why, that's why people think I'm yelling at them when I'm preaching. <laughs> so, so one of the things that they told me was that you need to smile more when you're preaching. So, and so not only do I try to smile, I also check on you throughout the sermon, right? So that's why I ask you, you all right? You all right? Because I, listen, I, I don't want to hurt you. My, my passion might be coming across as very aggressive and, and, you know, very like, oh my gosh, Pastor Josh yelled at me. I'm not yelling at you. I'm passionate, okay? So see, I learned that about, I learned that about myself about personality tests. So here's, we're going to have a little fun. You ready to have a little fun? We're going to give Paul and Barnabas some personality profiles. All right. So here's Paul. Paul probably is a high D. So if you're familiar with DISC profile, he's probably a high D. Myers Briggs, he's probably a ENTJ, which is a commander. The Enneagram, he's probably an eight or an achiever. Any eights or threes out there? Any eights or threes? Okay. Avoid them. All right. I'm just, I'm just just joking. I'm just, I'm just playing. Just playing. so, uh, uh, strength finders, uh, achiever, competition, and maximizer. So if you're not familiar, let's dig, let's dig a little deeper. All right. So a D uh, is competitive, decisive. He risk taker, demanding. He's commanding. He's firm. He's straightforward. He's impatient. He's intense. So could you imagine? I mean, this is a sharp disagreement. And Paul's like, I, I'm not taking this kid. This kid is not dependable. We need somebody who is dependable. We're results oriented, Barney. Come on now. Listen, leave that, leave that kid with his mama. Like, I mean, he is high D, all right? And, and then if he was a Myers-Briggs, he's decisive, objective, logical. He's direct. Uh, he can be challenging, competent, assertive, theoretical, questioning. He's very strategic. He's like, man, I ain't, got, I ain't got time to develop this kid. Man, the mission is too important there, Barney. Like, come on now, get with the program. And then if, if he's in Enneagram 8 or 3, he, he likes a challenge. He's very intense. He's bold. He's aggressive, controlling, assertive. If he's a 3, he's going to seek success, achievement. He's going to be driven, ambitious. That's the reason why he, he's like, man, I, I've, I've got to do what the Lord's called me to do. I ain't got time to babysit John Mark. So he's probably an 8 or 3. Now, full disclosure, I'm a D, an ENTJ, and I'm a three on the Enneagram, all right? So, uh, so I can identify, I can identify with Paul. All right, so here's Barney, all right? Here's Barney. All right, he's a high I, probably an ISFP, Myers-Briggs, which is the versatile supporter. Enneagram, he's probably a two. He could have some nine characteristics, but he's more than likely a two. And then his strength finders is a developer or he's, uh, he's em empathetic. All right, so what, what does that mean, Josh? All right, so hi, I, he's lively, he's trusting, he's optimistic, he's friendly, he's positive, he's persuasive, he's eager, energetic, emotional, enthusiastic, and he's probably thinking, Paul, man, let's see the good in this kid. Man, God, God's got his hand on John Mark. Can you not see this? Let's give this sucker a chance. Come on, let's give him another chance. Come on. Get with the program. He's trying to influence Paul because he's positive. Or if he is an ISFP, he's practical, he's caring, he's considerate, he's kind, he's observant, he's tolerant. He's like, you know, listen, he's a kid. I can tolerate some behavior. Like, he's got to grow, all right? So he's this versatile supporter of John Mark. And, and then if he is an Enneagram, he's probably, like I said, he's an Enneagram too. He seeks to serve, to give, to be empathetic to be selfless, selfless, nurturing, 
Uh, you know, if he is an Enneagram 9, he's going to seek the peace. He's going to be friendly, easygoing, positive, and dreamy. I mean, this is Paul and Barnabas. They are wired completely differently. And I don't think when you, when you look at Paul and you look at Barnabas, I don't think I'm too far off in giving them these personality profiles. And how God had wired their personalities led to this sharp disagreement. It was one of the main elements that led to this sharp disagreement. So that's the first element, the, the personalities of the leaders. But, but then the second element is the purpose of the mission or the purpose of the pro, you know, project. And the third element is the people that you need to accomplish the mission. All right, so let's take the second element. So you got the purpose of the mission or the project. So there's really two sides to this. There, there's the job title and then the summary of, of the job, all right? So the job title and then the summary of the job, which then after that, you build out a job description, okay? And then after you build out the job description, then you go find a person to fulfill the job, the summary, and ultimately the description. So what was the job summary for this for this particular mission project. Well, we see it in the scriptures. Here's the job summary that Paul says. Let us, Barnabas, go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. That is the job summary. All right, I'm gonna give it a job title too. Here's a possible job title. Missionary Discipleship Catalyst. That, that's what, so Paul and Barnabas, hey, let's be a missionary discipleship catalyst. Let's go back to all the churches that were planted in our first missionary journey. Let's see how they're doing and strengthen them where necessary. So that's the job title and the job summary. Now, after you get that, what you're going to do is you're going to put together a job description. Now here at Northam, when we put together a job description, it can be for an entry level job, it can be for a senior level job. Here's how we break it down. We break it down, a job description to character. Who, who do we need for this? Do we, is, is someone who is less mature, can they fill this role? Or do we need somebody more mature? Do we need them to fill this role? And then conviction, what, what do they love? What are they passionate about? Like what gets there? What gets it's their heart beating fast. What do they wake up wanting to do? And then competencies, here's their skills. They're skilled at this. They're skilled at doing all these things because what you're gonna need, you're gonna need skills to accomplish the summary of the job and to fulfill the job title, right? And then coaching, how much investment is needed in this person? So I promise you, anytime you get a job description from Northland, you're gonna see that break down. Character, conviction, competencies, and coaching. And so when you look at what's going on here with Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas, when he's building out the job description and who he's going to look for to fulfill the job description, he's looking to build a JV team. Paul is looking to build a professional team. And it's just how they are wired and how they see this job unfolding. And so because how Paul is wired and how he sees this mission, this project, he's going to see John Mark as the wrong person. And he would be right of how he's wired and how he sees this. Barnabas, on the other hand, how he's wired and how he sees this mission project and this job, he sees John Mark as the right person and he is right. Now, here's what I want to talk about though, because some of you, this far, you're gonna identify with Paul. I identify with Paul. Some of you, you're going to identify with Barney, and praise the Lord, I have no idea how Barney, like, I know how Barney thinks, but I've never, I've never done any of that in my life. So, so it's really, really cool to see Barnabas and Paul in this room, but I want you to know that there are some blind spots to Paul, and there are some blind spots to Barnabas, and I wanna show you those blind spots. So Paul has two, and Barnabas has two. All right, so blind spot number one for Paul. You can put the wrong person on the team that isn't ready and how you are wired and what you are asking from them will crush them. Like this happened to me. So I came into ministry at the ripe old age of 17 years of age. 
Like I was on staff at a church. And then a couple of years later at the ripe old age of 19, I became the senior high student pastor at the fastest growing church in the state of Tennessee. That crushed me. Because I'm 19 years old, I barely know how to drive, okay? Like how am I gonna lead 125 teenagers? I am a teenager. But they gave me the title senior high student pastor and I thought I was big stuff. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, look at me, I'm 19 years of age in this position. But here's the thing, everybody looking at me wanted me to be a 39 year old seasoned student pastor. And so the expectations placed upon me from both the pastor and the adults and the parents crushed me. So sometimes you can put the wrong person in a position that they're not right for the job yet. And because you put them in a job that they're not ready for, you will crush them. The other blind spot is this, is that you can miss putting the right person on the team that isn't quite ready, but how you are wired and what you're asking from them will challenge them and cause them to grow exponentially. I've also seen this too, because here's what's, here's what's happening. You get passed over because you don't have the actual resume they're looking for, but actually you are actually qualified for the job and you would knock the job out of the park, but because you don't look right on paper, they pass over you. See, we, we, we like to judge a book by its cover, meaning we like to judge a book by the resume. But I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of times that you might pass over the person that is right for the job, but they're not quite ready. But if you gave them the opportunity, they would excel because of the way you are wired and they are wired would exponentially grow. So you gotta be, you gotta be aware of those blind spots. And then Barnabas, he has these two blind spots, is that you can put the wrong person on the team that is more than ready and how you are wired and what you are asking from them will frustrate them because it won't be challenging enough for them. Because you're more like Barnabas. You're caring, you're loyal, you're trusting, you're accommodating. You're not very intense, you're not really challenging, but that's okay, that's how you're wired. But you put some like young Apostle Paul kind of underneath you, you will frustrate them because of how you are wired and how you are leading them because they will see that you're babying them, that you're micromanaging them, and you will frustrate them. And it will cause a fracture on the team. Or then Barnabas, you can put the right person on the team that takes advantage of how you are wired and what you are asking them to do and thereby enable them to be lazy and stagnant in their development. See, because Barney, Barney's out there, you got, a, you got a good heart. You got a caring heart. You wanna give people the benefit of the doubt. You got an optimistic heart. But I wanna tell you something. There are some people out there that will take advantage of your heart and you will do them more damage because you will let them be lazy and stagnant and unproductive. So you, you, gotta, you gotta watch that blind spot. And then, let me, let me talk to my young people here for a second. Where you are, listen to me, where you are in your development can determine the kind of leader you need to serve under. And so just be aware that when you're having these interviews, just make, ask, ask some good questions to see how they are wired. Because how you are wired and how they are wired will determine the kind of leader you need to serve under. This is why I truly believe in developing leadership pipelines and leadership pathways to help grow people into what God is crafting them to be and who God is crafting them to be. Now, here's a question that some of you won't answer though, and now let me answer it for you. All right, so when do leaders need to consider parting ways? Because that's what we see here with Barnabas and Paul. So when do leaders need to consider parting ways? Well, there's two answers. The first is when there is no authority and no agreement, you may need to go your separate ways. So what you have to understand with Paul and Barnabas, they are both equal. Paul is not in authority over Barnabas and Barnabas is not in authority over Paul. So there is no authority. They are partners in ministry. And now they have come to a very sharp disagreement around missional strategy, who to take and what to accomplish. And because there's no authority and no agreement, they needed to go their separate ways. And we, we see this today in business, right? We saw that with the Facebook guys. 
Mark and Eduardo. Uh, you see it on teams uh, sometimes, like Shaq and Penny. You see it in bands. They're like, well, we can't, we, we can't agree now on, on some, some common strategies. We, we need to break up. So maybe you went into business with your family and you're like, all right, we, we, are, at, we are at now this crossroads and we just cannot agree. Or maybe you went into business with a friend. Maybe you went into a ministry you know, with, with a family member or a friend. And now you are finding this just one debate after another around strategy, around philosophy. For the sake of the mission, go ahead and split ways, all right? Here's the, here's the second answer though. When there is an authority but no agreement, the subordinate will either need to submit humbly or graciously withdraw. Now, now why? Because that's biblical. Now, once again, I'm not telling you this is a church unity matter. They're, they're not separating over what they believe about Jesus and how one is saved. They're splitting over a mission project and a mission strategy. So if you have a boss that is doing something illegal, I'm not telling you to submit humbly, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But when it comes to strategy, when it comes to philosophy, if you have somebody in authority that is telling you to do it one way and you don't want to do it and you don't want to submit under their authority, then you need to graciously withdraw, Okay, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a for instance in my own life. So years ago, I was at this church and this guy was like, he, he was significantly older than, than me and he had been at the church for about uh, 11, 12 years and I sat down with him and I said, hey bro, um, he, here's the thing. You have a completely different philosophy around small groups than I do. So one or two things is going to happen. Either you're going to stay and continue to do it your way and you're going to frustrate the blank out of me. No, I didn't say it that way. So, but anyways, I said, you're gonna, you're gonna frustrate me. And then if you do stay and you start doing it my way and you don't like my way, you don't love my way, you don't see it as the right way, then you're not going to do it with passion and conviction. And so either you're going to be frustrated or I'm going to be frustrated. And so for the sake of the health of the church, then what we need to do is start working on your exit plan. And I'll give you a long runway to get off. Well, he didn't like that. He, he, he went to start, you know, then, then he just got everybody else involved. But here's the thing. He could not humbly submit to the authority in his life. And so he did not graciously with draw. Here's what I want you to know is that if you do not submit humbly or graciously withdraw, you might find yourself rightfully fired. <laughs> you don't have to, I mean, if you want to clap for being rightfully fired, that's fine. But here's the thing, like, I, I want, like, I want, I want you to, okay, I want you to know that it's okay to rightfully fire people who are not submitting to authority because it does the mission project no, what, no good if there's not agreement on what God's doing. Okay. So, so that's what we see with Paul and Barnabas. You, you, here, here's the principle. I love the principle. Uh, God's division can be God's multiplication. That's crafty, Pastor Josh. Yeah, it is. Like, like, so here's the thing. God can divide two people because they disagree on philosophy and strategy, but in doing so, multiply mission. Like, I love that. I love that because God is working through their personality. He's working through their understanding of the job description. He's working through their understanding of who needs to be on the team. And he's using how they're wired to lead to more mission efforts. So that's the leadership lesson. Here's the life lesson. Although you have a rocky start, don't give up. You can still rock it and finish it well. That's what we see with John Mark. Um, and here's where I'm probably going to get vulnerable with you because not only can I identify with Paul and Barnabas, I can really identify with John Mark. And here are the three things I want you to know about John Mark. Number one is everyone has or everyone can have rocky starts. John Mark, he quit on Paul and Barnabas. How would you like that on your resume? Like I quit on Paul. And then how, how would you like it if Paul, the greatest apostle, missionary, mind of church history, rejects your application the second time and doesn't want you. 
And then how would you like to have the asterisk by your name that you were the reason why the dynamic duo of Paul and Barnabas broke up? <laughs> That's John Mark. How do you think that made John Mark feel? Like this is rocky. Yeah, uh, let me give you an image of all of these people. Uh, they all had rocky starts. J.K. Rowling, George Lopez, Jerry Seinfeld, Sylvester Stallone, the Rocky. Uh, and then you got Michael Jordan, Walt Disney, Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, and Oprah Winfrey. If you read their story, they all had rocky starts. Everyone has rocky starts. So maybe, maybe you've had a rocky start. Maybe you are in a rocky season. But to be honest, the, the first 20 years of ministry was rocky for me. I told you I was on church staff when I was 17 years old. And from the time I was 17 to about 37, those 20 years, they were rocky for me. I told you I had a pastor who put me in a position before I was ready and he and other people crushed me. And then I started leading as a lead pastor and a senior pastor at the ripe old age of 24. I had, I had a lot of passion. I mean, I, I, was, I had my water gun in hand and I was charging hell with a water pistol. I mean, I was ready. Had no idea what I was doing, but I had a lot of passion. In my first ministry, I burned out. Now, I didn't know that at the time. Like we weren't talking about self-care, soul care. A lot, of, a lot of burnout talk was not available yet. So I didn't know what was happening. And this is why if you are at that verge where you're burned out, don't make any major decision. See, I made a major decision because I'm like, oh my gosh, ministry now has turned brown. I, the grass has to be greener on the other side. So I'm like, I'll leave this ministry. I'll go somewhere else where the grass has to be greener is browner because that lasted about nine months before some leaders rejected my leadership. And then I went to another church that chewed me up and spit me out in about 12 months. They couldn't handle how God had wired me and how I would lead. They could not handle some of my leadership deficiencies. Like, I, I, you know, when I'm looking back, I'm like, guys, like I was 28, 29 years old. Do you think I was gonna be a seasoned pastor of, at the, age, you know, at the age of 28, 29, no, I'm gonna have deficiencies. But they couldn't handle my deficiencies. They couldn't handle how God had wired me. And so I lasted a good 12 months there. And, and then that, that led to my family and I going into this ministry called the City of Refuge in Woodstock, Georgia. Now the City of Refuge, it was a ministry for pastors and families who had been hurt, who had gone through rocky seasons at, at, at a church where they could get re recovery, where they could get rest and respite, uh, where they could, if, if, their, if their relationship with one another had been fractured, they could see it repaired and reconciled. And so Joni and I, we spent over a year there at the City of Refuge. It, it truly did, it saved us. Because of all of the church hurt, all of the scars that we had, we needed that time to heal. And I can be honest with you, I didn't know. We didn't know if we would go back into vocational ministry. Like about six months in, I'm like, I'm ready. Joni's like, I, listen, don't even ask me right now. And then even after a year, she's like, ah, I, I don't know, I don't know. And so here's the thing, here's one of the things I know is that you can't drag your wife where she doesn't wanna go. And if you do drag your wife where she doesn't want to go, you need to kind of consider, you know, really seriously consider your marriage. Okay? So, so I had to wait. I had to wait on Joni. So I didn't know if I would go back into vocational ministry. And then she got to the point where God had released her to go back in. And so we went back in, but we found ourselves at the most toxic church that we had ever been a part of. And even though towards the end of that season, it was hard. We look back and God rescued me. He rescued our family by sending us to Wheaton College. And he used Ed Stetzer in my life to be the Barnabas that I needed. And so for three and a half years, I served at Wheaton College, the Billy Graham Center, taught as an adjunct professor, but I want you to understand, like, 
When Ed, and you've seen Ed, if you've been here any time, Ed has preached here on a couple of different occasions. In describing my resume, here's what Ed says. You have train tracks all over you. How would you like, how would you like someone to tell you that's how they see your resume? that you have been ran over and there must be, and not just one time, but multiple times. There's, so there has to be a story. So when I read John Mark, I'm like, I identify with John Mark. I know what, it, I know what it's like to have a rocky start. I know what it's like to leave. I know what it's like to quit. I know what it's like to be rejected. I know what it's like to have a forced termination. I know what it's like to seem like you are a failure, that people define you by what is written on a piece of paper. I know, which leads to number two. I can't even say it without crying. Everyone needs rocks in their life. So when John, Mark, learns that Paul rejected him, he needed Barnabas to receive him. Here's the Barnabases in my life. So this is Chris Fryer. Every time I went through a season of disappointment and darkness, I could get on the phone and I could call Chris Fryer and he would encourage me. He would tell me to keep my head up. Believe God's not done with you. Then eventually I would meet Kevin Harney. He was here this past November. Huge encouragement. Ed, I, I texted Ed a couple of days ago and I said, Ed, I'm like looking through all my pictures and undoubtedly we have never taken a picture together. We've known each other for, I mean like 10 plus years and we've never taken a picture together. So I said, next time we're together, can we please take a picture together? Because I want people to know that you are a Barnabas in my life. It's my dad. It's my mom, but in that center is my wife. Uh, she's here, and I knew that the service you'd be in, I would just like I'd lose it. Because if you appreciate anything that comes out of my life, you better thank that woman. She has been the greatest part of us in my life. We all need, we all need the Barnabases in our life. People who believe in us when we don't believe in ourselves. People who will pick us up when others kick us down. People who will love us when we've been despised. People who will speak truth over us when we are believing lies. People who will believe that our best days lie ahead of us and not behind us. That will give us a chance when others have given up on us. Who will pray for us, support us, and fight for us. Who will be present with us when everybody has abandoned us who will embody our loving father and king. Everyone needs rocks in their life. And Joan, I have never done this publicly, but I will. I love you. And I'm grateful to God for you. She's mine, though, just know that. <laughs> the third point, everyone can still rock it. It might start out rocky, but God's going to give you some rocks so that you can build upon, so that you can eventually rock it. You see, the thing I love about John Mark is John Mark would actually go on to write the gospel of Mark. 
he would write a book of the Bible. And where he makes a cameo appearance is at the very end of the book when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and they come to arrest him. There's this young man there who has just a linen cloth because he's just intrigued about what's going on. The authorities try to grab him too, but they end up ripping the linen, linen cloth off of him and he runs butt naked back to home. That's John Mark's cameo in the gospel of Mark. He started off rocky, <laughs> I mean, like butt naked in the gospel of Mark. I mean, that's a pretty rocky start. But then look at what Paul says of him. Now, this is 2 Timothy 4. The reason why this is really important is that 2 Timothy is the letter that Paul writes to Timothy that says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have ran my course. He's at the end of his life, but here's what he writes to Timothy. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. You see, Mark didn't give up. Mark kept showing up. He kept digging, he kept learning, he kept growing, he kept improving. He didn't point fingers, didn't blame anybody. He didn't throw in the towel. He kept going and he rocked it. You see, this is my experience. Because you could imagine after disappointment, after disappointment, after disappointment, rejection, after rejection, after rejection. Man, I could have led somebody into a dark hole. But I used those disappointments as my development. So I don't know where you are. You, you might be in a rocky season right now. You might be in a disappointing season right now, but let that season of disappointment be the season of development. You see, what I would do is I would write down what went wrong. I would write down what I owned. I would write down where I could improve. Eventually, I would go on to write a personal essay for me. I've never published this essay. And I've entitled that essay, Confessions of a Young Pastor. And things that I'd learned. I'd learned that the grass is not always greener on the other side. I have learned that you need to close your yap. That, that means your mouth. I needed to learn that I needed to quit helping God. God didn't need my help. God didn't need me to manufacture some things in order to see results. I needed to learn to be a catcher and not a pitcher. I needed to ask more questions than demand stuff. <laughs> One of my favorite lessons is don't marry an ugly girl hoping you can make her beautiful. <laughs> I didn't give up, I grew up. You see, John, he didn't give up, he grew up. And let that season of disappointment, let it grow you. Don't let it defeat you. Here's the takeaways. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He did not abandon John. Failures and rejections don't define you, but develop you. Please don't let your failures, listen. I could have let my failures, my less than successes define me. But I wanted to let God use them to develop me. Which is why I believe with all of my heart, church, please listen to me. I believe that now at 41 years of age, God has me with the people and in a place where by the grace of God, I do really feel like I'm rocking it. You're going to fail forward and not backward. Don't isolate yourself from the failures. Lean into them. Own them. Own them. 
and then latch on to people who know you and still believe in you. Because I promise you, there's going to be only a handful of people that that will be true of you is that you can latch on to just a handful of people who actually know you and still believe in you. Don't let them go. Don't let them go. So that's the leadership lesson and the life lesson we learned in Acts 15. Let's pray. Father, what a good God we serve. So grateful for your word. Grateful for the power of your word and the applicative nature of your word, that it truly does apply to every realm of our life. So I pray over my Paul and Barnabas this this morning. I pray over my John Marks. I pray that you would encourage them, that you would give them insight into how they are wired and how they lead. I pray for the John Marks in this room as part of our extended family, that you would encourage them in their disappointments, knowing that they can still rock it in your goodness and grace. For it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, hey, will you stand with me as uh, we are about to be sent out? A couple things. We have the blood drive going on. Uh, We have our night of worship, 630 in the rink. Also, if you want to find ways to connect with us in our commission of how we are being used to share and show the gospel locally and globally, you can visit our commission area. If you don't have a smaller group and you would like to be a part of one, you can visit our Cultivate area, and that's where you can find all the various life groups. If you need prayer, we will have our prayer team up here after you are sent out. So if you need prayer of wisdom, if you've been hurt, you're going through a season of disappointment and you want uh, someone to pray over you, we will have a prayer team up here. If you have a, a, a disease, if you have healing in your life that you would love for us to pray over, to my very left in that room, we will have James 5 prayer where we will have some of our leaders and elders praying over you uh, for, for healing and restoration. Father, into your hands we commit our life and our leadership. May we lead and live in the image and likeness of our King, King Jesus. Amen. Church, you are sent out to be the salt and light of the world.